It was the attack that was never supposed to happen. And when it did, what happened next happened just like it was supposed to. The building rocked like you're on a, on a, on a, on a ship. Um, and it swayed back and forth a couple of times. The World Trade Center's North Tower shook and swayed, but thanks to a design concept engineers call redundancy, did not fall, not right away. If the load carrying capability is disturbed or destroyed in one area, within reason, it should be able to, tr the structure should be able to transfer the load uh, from that point and carry it down to the foundation using a different path. That's what happened at the World Trade Center. After the impact, the North Tower stood for more than an hour, long enough for hundreds, perhaps thousands, to escape. The collapse, when it came, was caused by fire. The fire was very, very intense and burned for a long time. The fire weakened that portion of the structure which remained after the impact. It was weakened by the fire to the point where it could no longer sustain the load. When the World Trade Center towers did fall, they pancaked onto themselves, minimizing damage to adjacent structures, just like the center's designers had intended should disaster ever strike. In the 90s, after Oklahoma City, many government buildings were retrofitted to better withstand bomb blasts. But when an airliner hit the heavily reinforced Pentagon, the seat of the nation's military leadership didn't stand a chance. A large jet full of fuel hitting uh, structures about as severe as it gets. In the days after the World Trade Center tragedy, Georgia Tech's Barry Goodnow suggested it would be technically possible, but too expensive, to design a totally disaster-proof building, unless, he said, the building were built underground. David George, CNN. The attacks in the U.S. have taken a heavy financial toll, forcing the closure of the New York Stock Exchange and some other markets. For the latest, we turn to CNN's Richard Quest in London. Richard. Indeed, Relitza. Uh, but there was some good cheer to the extent that the Chicago bond market managed to reopen on Thursday. It was a shortened session, and we saw, of course, the price of U.S. Treasuries jump. Monday will be the big day. That's when U.S. stock markets, including the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq, they're due to reopen after the four-day closure. Exchange officials plan to test the trading systems over the weekend. The new business day has just started here in Europe. I believe Liz George is at the London Stock Exchange uh, to bring us up to date as how early indications. Liz? Richard, uh, thanks very much indeed. I'll show you the figures that uh, our markets are actually trading at, but I want to add a, co a note of caution here, really. Um, no one's taking too much notice at the moment of what's happening on these indices. They're jumping around all over the place. Uh, really, there's very, very light trade going through there. There's an awful lot of wanting to wait and see, waiting for the US markets to open. There's a a big feeling of awareness, really, that even when those U.S. markets do open, we're going to have probably around about four weeks of, of enormous volatility before things begin to settle down. So people are very, very aware that actually, although these figures are coming out, trades are being done, um, really prices are being set at wild levels at the moment. So it's very, very light trading. There's an awful lot of movement in these markets, uh, wavering around in this very thin trade. So at the moment, the FTSE is up 0.39%. The DAX is up 0.86%. And uh, in France, the CAC 40 is up one percent to four percent richard liz george at the london stock exchange a quick reminder that there were some gains in asia in the overnight trade in both tokyo uh, and hong kong now as rescuers continued the grim task of sifting through the rubble it's becoming increasingly clear the size and scale of the damage not only from the destruction to the world trade centers but to the surrounding buildings and businesses the insurance industry believes that the cost of repairing the physical damage could be well in excess of 20 billion dollars andy cook is the editor of insurance <coughs> times he joins me now for a closer look at the long-term impact of, of, of the attack uh, andy it's unsavory but we must to some extent the size and scale in relation to the insurance industry well we've been talking to actuaries who are the uh, accountants of the insurance industry and they're saying that it could be up to 100 billion um, although the lower limit is sort of 50 to 20 but you know the, the 100 billion is certainly a possibility and this isn't just of course for the for the buildings it's for the tremendous loss of life it's for the loss of business G give me an idea of how far and wide this goes 
Well, it, it starts with the uh, public liability of, um, say, the World Trade Center itself and the injuries and effects on the businesses around that. But it goes as far as um, UK, Europe, um, businessmen in Europe trying to fly to America. They're going to put claims in against their travel insurers because they haven't been able to go across. Uh, and the ripples just, you know, go ever further. At the end of the day, when blame is finally laid, and besides the blame, I mean, besides the terrorists who committed the act, we're talking about where the insurance blame lies. It's possible that this will all end up with either the airlines, the airports, or the security companies. Is that right? That's right. Uh, the chain of events would be that the companies within, say, the World Trade Center will um, claim against the World Trade Center itself. The World Trade Center may then claim against the airlines, and the airlines then after may claim against the airports for letting the hijackers onto the planes. Can the insurance industry withstand these vast sort of losses? Yes, the, the uh, sums we're talking about are being shared around many, many companies. Um, the sort of structure of it is that you have an insurer and underneath that the insurer then gets its policies reinsured and the reinsurers themselves get reinsured. So we're actually talking about lots and lots of companies sharing small packets of um, costs. Now, in, Lo in London, Lloyds of London rang the looting bell, which of course is rung at times of great tragedy. Mm. Um, this is often thought of as the centre of the insurance world, but also Zurich as well. The, the European mm. companies there will bear a lot of the financial loss. Some of the biggest um, uh, companies to take a loss in this will be from Central Europe. People like Zurich Re, Swiss Re, Munich Re, they're the companies that underpin the whole industry. Andy Cook, many thanks indeed. That's the way the business world looks for the moment from London. Relitza is in Atlanta for the rest of the news. Relitza. Richard, thank you. Looking ahead, Friday is an official day of mourning in the United States and Europe. President Bush is planning to visit New York for a first-hand look at the devastation. The FBI is questioning eight people arrested at New York's two major airports in a security crackdown. Sources say four of them also were challenged at one of the airports on the day of the attacks. Thursday, they were taken into custody for carrying fake documentation, including one suspect carrying a phony pilot's license. What happened on Tuesday has brought about acts of extraordinary kindness from Main Street to Wall Street. G, Cisco, Microsoft and AT&T are just a few of the giant names that have pledged millions of dollars to the rescue operations. It's all part of an effort that's seen business big and small play its part. Susan Lisovich has more. New York's financial district remains shut down, but they are already back in business on this ping pong table two miles north. Employees of the consulting firm Casina can't get to their lower Manhattan offices because the area is sealed off, but they're working in a makeshift office donated by a local business. Obviously, finding space is, is amazing. You know, two days later, we have a, a new phone number and, and some space to, to you know, get back and continue doing what we need to do. The Silicon Alley reporter is offering 14,000 square Midtown office space free to businesses left homeless by Tuesday's terrorist attack. Another firm, Bluefly.com, is donating 9,000 square feet of space. Domino's Pizza offered to send pizzas up for the new tenants, and we've had uh, people who have volunteered uh, engineering services and computer services and furniture rentals. So it's been pretty surprising, it, and, and, and we're obviously grateful for the response that's f followed on from this. We can give you any amount of voicemail. Okay. Oh, so, really? Yeah. The CEO of the Silicon Alley reporter says it is the right thing to do. We have to realize that one of the reasons that people did this was to screw up our economy. It wasn't just to psychologically scar us, to kill people. They want to shut down the economy. And these companies, mid-sized companies, small-sized companies, are the bulk of our economy. And they're going to go out of business. And people are going to lose their jobs. For those helping out in this time of crisis, it is goodwill and good business. Susan Lasovich, CNN Financial News, New York. 30 years ago, building the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center was a proud achievement for thousands of workers. Taking it apart, piece by shattered piece, is a sad affair. But as correspondent John Vaz and photographer Tim Wall discovered, hard work is hard work.
never in my wildest imagination did I think this building was going to come down. I, I really believed in my heart that we were here to save people, not to carry uh, our brothers out. I mean, I worked on uh, seven World Trade. I was one of the engineers when we built it. And now here I am taking it down. Well, we're working on 24-hour shifts. 24 on, 24 off. It can't be described. It can't be described. It can't be. It's just. It's unbelievable. Our extensive coverage of America under attack continues. For now, I'm Jonathan Mann. And I'm Relita Vasilova. We leave you now with the latest pictures that we received on the remarkable devastation and the extent of the devastation in Manhattan. These pictures shot by a structural engineer.